Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Our guest today is Mr. Chris Vermillion. Chris is a technical analyst within the financial markets. He is an internationally recognized expert trader whose work is featured in dozens of financial publications and websites. He is the founder of Technical Traders LTD. He is also the author of the book, Seven Steps to Win with Logic. And with barely a trace of logic left in the world, we're thrilled to have him here to get his perspectives. Chris, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great, thanks. Thanks for having me, Michelle. We are thrilled, and we're going to start off, Chris, with precious metals. We All have right. a lot of excitement going on in that sector, and we're hearing everywhere that this is it, Chris, that we are headed straight into a fantastic, massive bull market, and gold has actually hit a record high. Silver has had its best month since 1979. From your perspective, as a technical analyst, what are your thoughts? Sure. Yeah, there's a lot going on in gold. I mean, really, the whole precious metal sector is getting really exciting. But gold started the charge last year, last July. So over a year ago, gold broke into a bull market. And that's when investors and, and our investors, we all got long gold because once something starts a bull market, it should run for many months, if not many years. So last year, it really got exciting for gold. And, uh, you know, it's testing that $2,000 mark now, which, you know, people really didn't see coming uh, a year ago. And it's getting exciting because 2000 is a really critical level. Not only is it a whole kind of mental number, everyone's talking about if it gets to 2000, I mean, that's something new. Uh, it's a major resistance area from previously on the charts uh, on a technical standpoint. So once we break and can hold above 2000 on the weekly and monthly chart of gold, I mean, I think it could be off to the races for, you know, an, another, you know, 800 point move, which is huge. So there's a lot of upside in gold, which is really exciting. And then there's the other sectors like the precious metal miners and silver that are kind of lagging, but they've started some pretty exciting moves as well this year. Now, when you talk about the $2,000 mark as being a threshold, explore that for us a little bit more. Sure. So $2,000 is, is just a little bit above the high we saw in 2011, 2012. And the markets love to go back up and test recent highs. And so it's going to act as a resistance level. Now, based on the March lows in gold uh, and, the, and the recent rallies, technical analysis using Fibonacci extensions, just gets a little technical, but it points to the momentum of gold hitting $1,967 to the $2,000 mark. And so that's where the recent rally from the March lows was pointing to saying, hey, this should run all the way to pretty much 2000, which it has as of a couple of days ago. And so now that we're at this critical level, I think there's going to be sellers starting to step into this market, which we've seen. We actually saw some pretty good intraday volatility in overnight trading a couple of sessions ago where silver fell 15% overnight. Almost no one knows about it because it happened outside of regular trading hours. And then it rebounded just before the market opened. Gold fell 4%. Gold miners fell 7%. All this happened like between midnight and, and 9.30 opening bell a few nights ago. So there's some big sellers stepping in there, but it got quickly bought up because people are in buying mode for precious metals. So any dip right now is getting bought. But the fact that it happened right after gold hit the 2000 mark and uh, everyone is starting to pile into this trade just goes to show I think it's a little bit of a crowded trade. We're probably going to see more selling step in over the next couple of weeks. And hopefully we see it actually pause and pull back because when price runs straight up into resistance, it usually comes right back down. So if price can consolidate for a few weeks or even months, the longer it trades sideways here, the bigger the next move to the upside. So uh, it's going to be healthy to see it hold and kind of trade sideways. And that goes across the board for, for miners and silver as well. Hmm. So you don't see a straight up move like everyone's sort of envisioning at the moment. I can vision it. I would love to see it. Uh, but I mean, it's just right now in the charts, I think we could be primed and ready for a pause and pullback. Now, there's two different ways to see this market, right? So if you're a, a short term trader, uh, I would like to see this pause and pullback because it's going to give an opportunity and a launch pad for another rally to the upside. If you're a long-term investor, 
And I think everybody should hold physical medals uh, as a long-term position. Then it really doesn't matter what it does. Long-term, I think we're going a lot higher. If, if the medals really just continue to rip higher to the upside and there's no looking back, that's fine because everyone should have medals in their portfolio long-term. But as a trader, I like to see it stair-step its way up. It gives you clear targets, clear uh, limited uh, stop losses so you can protect yourself in case the market crashes uh, because they're not going to be fully immune to the stock market crash, just like we saw in 2008 in previous bear markets. If the stock market rolls over and crashes, there's going to be forced liquidation just like we saw in March and they're going to get pulled down, which isn't a bad thing. It just means it could be a little bit of a bumpy ride for a little while until the bear market maybe gets into the later stages. And then I think that's when we see gold, silver miners take off probably in 2021, 2022 could be that mega wave that everyone's dreaming of. We're all dreaming of where gold goes to 5,000, 10,000, whatever silver, you know, breaks a hundred. I think that's a lot further out than people think, but I mean, we're in the perfect market condition with stimulus Everything's falling apart. I mean, it's the perfect storm for metals. So they might hold their ground uh, and continue to go. So you got to own it as a long-term core position for sure. Now, you just mentioned the mining companies. Um, they seem to be following the physical metal in a way. There's not that immense excitement about it yet. What's the timeline from your perspective? Yeah, it's really interesting because the gold miners uh, in general, when you look at the big ETFs that hold the basket of them, like GDX and GDXJ, those ETFs, they're really, I mean, they're performing well, but they're dramatically underperforming what I think a lot of us were expecting. Typically, gold miners rally first, gold follows, and then silver happens next. But this time around, it's been very different. We saw gold break out a year ago. Gold miners just broke out only a couple months ago. So that goes to show us that there's global fear and global fear is moving into the next safe haven asset, which is physical gold. So it's a little different than what we've seen in the past. I think people are really worried about their currencies, all the printing going on, and uh, people are trying to get money out of the financial system because I don't think a lot of people trust what's going on. I mean, you got the shadow banking system completely collapsing and charging 10% rates to banks. There's stuff going on behind the scenes that are just showing that they're just really mask taping all over all these issues and most people don't see them brewing. So uh, gold miners are starting to perform well. I think they're going to do exceptionally well. They're a leverage play on gold itself. Uh, but again, they're going to be a little bit uh, suspect to issues if the stock market does start to tank and roll over. They're going to be under pressure for a little while. That's really interesting. Um what you just said, a lot of what you said, of course, but you brought up a fascinating point in that what we typically see in the metals market is not happening um, as far as the miners going first and the metals following. This is an aspect where the metals went first and the miners are following and all has to do with what's happening in a different sector, which is the printing of the dollar. So I'd like you to explore that just a little bit. That makes this very um, unpredictable, doesn't it? It does. Uh, to me, it means people aren't trusting the financial system. They're worried about currencies. And so what's the best way to get your money out of the financial system is to buy physical metals and to store them outside you know, of the banking system. Because let's face it, the banking system is like collapsing. It's breaking down. They're supposed to be the rocks that hold the country together and store our money and protect it. And what do they do? They take it, they leverage it, they gamble it, they sell off all kinds of their crappy debt to end users and screw us all. So, I mean, it's, that's why people are moving to gold. People got burned in 2008, 2009. And now people are like, you know what? Forget the currencies. I'm starting to move to gold and silver. And that's why they're really taking off as people I got, they got to get out of the grasp of the government. So that's what's actually causing this move, isn't it? Um, the people, the general public, not the typical big metal investors. Yeah, I think it's the masses. There's just so many people now saying, uh, I think I need to get some precious metals. What are ways to protect with all this chaos? And advisors will be saying, you know, well, do you have any gold? I see you don't have any gold or silver yet. You should probably buy some. You look at the U.S. dollar, it's, it's been selling off dramatically. 
it's not a good sign. So it's just a trickle, a steady stream of a lot of Joe Blow kind of investors accumulating metals for their first time. And we're far from everyone having their 5 or 10% allocation. And uh, that is, I mean, it's outweighing, I think, the, any manipulation in the market. I think it's just driving prices up. And uh, the forces kind of holding metals down for such a long time, I think, have, have or are losing control of keeping a, a lid on things to kind of make it look like there's not issues. But there's enough issues now globally that the markets are getting driven up. Uh, the metal prices. This has got to be an extraordinary experience for the people who have been manipulating the market for so long because they've, they're so used to having complete control, which is the truth. And now yeah. they don't. Yeah. And it's tough. I mean, there's a, I think there's a lot of manipulation. Everyone feels it. And I think a lot of people have kind of proved it, but no one ever really gets slapped on the wrist, it seems. Uh, but again, uh, this, you know, whoever's been manipulating it, hopefully is getting getting their fair share of uh, revenge here <laughs> with all the silver stackers and gold stackers driving price up and, and forcing those shorts to squeeze and, and get out of their plays. Like in silver, we saw a big breakout above 21 on silver. We talked about it before it broke. And when it, as soon as it broke 21, it was a huge short squeeze and people got slaughtered on that move who were betting against it or manipulating prices, which is great. This is such a fun time in precious metals because um, uh, I had Andy Sheckman on um, just recently, and he's talked about, you know, the bankers, you know, J.P. Morgan, how much trouble they're in because they've been caught now um, doing something that pretty much, as you mentioned, everybody knows they've been doing. But now that they've been caught doing it and they've been told not to do it, they have even less control. And then you combine that equation with the fact that everyone is losing confidence in the dollar and going toward precious metals. You have a scenario that's the perfect storm, really. It is. It's, it's, it's exciting, but it's really kind of nerve wracking because we don't want our big recession. We don't want a stock market collapse. We don't want the currencies to collapse. I mean, it's nice to be right on the right side of the trade to make money while chaos is happening. But I mean, it's not going to be fun if all this stuff actually plays out like a lot of us expect. I mean, you can't just keep printing money and putting band-aids. I mean, eventually this debt, the liabilities are, are they're building up record uh, people not being able to pay their loans and mortgages. I mean, these things are eventually going to catch up. And of course, they're talking about forcing uh, uh, homeowners to keep their tenants in. They're forcing them to stay in there. Well, but all these people who own real estate and now they can't get rent or they're going to have to start paying the real estate owners, you know, the rent for the people. There's, it's going to open a big can of worms. Uh, there's just a lot going on and the defaults are going to kick in at some point. I think three, six months from now, uh, it could be a huge wave that's going to make 2018. I mean, we've already made 2018 look like chump change. I mean, back then we thought 500 billion was a lot. Well, I mean, that's nothing now. So it's uh, pretty interesting what's going on. Right. What is your perspective as a technical analyst on the real estate market? What's going to happen when all of these loans really start to default? Or will the banks be blocked from foreclosing? What's your prediction? I don't know. I mean, you can't predict what they're going to do in the States and new rules they'll put in to try and protect people. I mean, I would think there's going to be a big default. There's going to be lots of homes getting foreclosed. They're already starting to spike, but it'll be interesting if the government steps in and says, hey, you don't have to pay your mortgage to the bank uh, for a certain amount of months or years. They could totally do that. But really, this is terrible for the real estate market. Commercial real estate, to me, is, is one of the worst, probably uh, biggest potential downside just because everyone is moving to home offices and they don't want to go back to work, a lot of them, in terms of having to commute every day. They'd rather stay home. So, Real estate to me is a very, it, it has mixed signals because with low interest rates, it makes refinancing, if you can get it, really cheap to own a piece of property, a big piece of property or many. Um, so it's, it's got confusing signals. They keep the rates low to help support the real estate market as part of, I think, their plan. But the defaults are going to eventually, I think, stack up that people can't afford it anyway. Uh, so, I mean, I think the prices will go down. Uh, but those low interest rates, I think, are definitely going to be a buffer to help support it. I don't think it'll be a full-out collapse, uh, but there's going to be weakness. And I think, I think it's still actually one to two years out. Usually, real estate is kind of after the stock market and the rest of the system kind of collapses. 
Uh, like in 2008, we really saw, you know, 2012 was really tough on homes because people have three and five year mortgages on average. So there's a big delay from when they get renewed and when they can or cannot get refinancing or renew their mortgages. So there's going to be a delay in real estate. Could be an amazing opportunity for people who have capital to buy up some amazing real estate properties, which to me is on the outskirts of cities in the country. It's got to be three bedrooms or more because everyone wants a home office. So multi-bedroom homes to me have way more value now than a tiny little uh, house in the city uh, because people are moving out of the cities uh, for COVID reasons, to downsize, to save money, uh, to reduce their mortgage, but get a bigger house. So there's a lot going on in the real estate market. It's going to be kind of a dance to figure out how it's going to unfold kind of month by month because we're still in this transition. It's like um, a working revolution. People are going from the commuting stage to now they're working from home. And so that is changing the real estate market. It's a big reason why tech is taking off. Everyone's buying technology for their new bedroom office and they're buying all the services they need. So it's the world retooling their working lifestyle from home and that's powering the economy. We're not booming by any means. It's just everyone is shifting the way they work. It's creating a big wave of buying that they need to do. It's not that they have money or can really do it, but they have to do it in order to stay alive and continue to work. So that's how I see things. This is just a change in environment, creating a buying wave, but this is going to fizzle out uh, once th this wave dies. Could be in a week, could be in a few months, but I'm pretty bearish on the equities market longer term. Let's talk about the equities market. What do you foresee? Yeah, so I think this market, I think we're in this complacency stage. During a, uh, the overall stock market cycle, you've got a, a basing formation, and then we get into a, a bull market, and then you get into a stage three topping phase, which um, is more or less when the market becomes very secular. So hot sectors start to outperform, other sectors are suffering, uh, you see precious metals come alive. When only certain groups of stocks are performing, that's when you know we're in the late stages of a bull market, money is being very selective where to go, and uh, all the things performing right now pretty much are, are what happens near the end of a bull market in equities? We see precious metals outperform. We see um, healthcare, utilities. Um, we see a lot of these sectors start to come to life, uh, which they have in the last month. Those are all outperforming the stock market. Uh, Technology has been doing all the heavy lifting. This is the perfect environment to keep the market afloat because it's tech heavy. Five tech companies really are about 35% of the NASDAQ value. So those five companies are holding the whole market up. Right now we're making higher highs with much less stocks supporting it. Less than 50% of stocks are above the 200 day moving average. So the market is just, is just creeping up and there's not many stocks holding it. And when it does collapse, it's gonna get pretty ugly. So I think we're in this, this dead cat bounce, this bear market bounce, and it's, it could drag out a little longer, but overall I do think we're on the last legs of a bull market and um, I think we're going to go back down for a double dip and it, it could get worse than that. First of all, what are the five stocks that are holding the whole market up? Out of curiosity. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, uh, those are kind of the, the really the main ones holding about 5 billion in assets and, and uh, really kind of supporting the market. I mean, they've all been on fire doing really well. It's the FANG stocks. Those big companies are just killing it with earnings. They've got the proper services and uh, support staff to handle what's going on, the huge surge in growth. And so they're really just can continue to climb and climb and climb. And they have such a big market share that it pulls the whole market up with it like a vacuum. Um, and you don't see it in the index. You see it in the indexes that they pull the index higher. But if you own a basket of stocks, random stocks in your portfolio, they're all sharply lower on the year. They're not performing well. And that's the problem with a lot of people. They get trying to pick stocks, trying to outmaneuver the markets. And so they're all sitting flat on the year. Well, if you traded the indexes, you know, you'd actually be up with the NASDAQ and things like that. So it's the market always has a way of moving to catch the average investor off guard. And so uh, stock pickers, if you're not in the right sectors, are dramatically underperforming right now. Um, but again, it's just this time of the market. It's a stock picker's market. You got to be good. You got to know which sectors to be in and be ready to 
unload your positions and lock in profits once this momentum starts to show signs of a reversal. Interesting. Now, Chris, um, do you think that the dollar is headed toward a bear market? Uh, it could be. It's really tough because once we start to see some panic selling in the stock market, we see this almost all the time as the US dollar actually rallies. It becomes, it is the, the world reserve currency. I know China's trying to get around that with their own digital currency, but um, more or less we see money flock to cash and then they move into the US dollar, whichever currency they're most comfortable with. We saw this back in March. Um, we actually were long bonds. We had a beautiful 20% move in bonds and then we moved to cash as the market started to crash. And the only asset that moved up uh, during the, the severe crash in March was the US dollar. And so that's where we put our money was in the US dollar. I think that could happen again when people actually are forced to liquidate and sell positions and they're actually fearful of, of what's going on, they move to cash. And most people are comfortable with the US dollar. So I think the dollar will have a bounce. I think it's getting oversold. When we do get into some stock market selling, I think the dollar is going to rally, but I think it'll be short-lived. I think after that rally of money moving into it, I think it's going to be devalued for a long time and continue to collapse, which is uh, definitely going to be a game changer for precious metals because a bear market in the U.S. dollar will definitely send gold, silver through the roof. Now, how high do you think that gold and silver could go and how low do you think the dollar could go? Could we have an ultimate just crash as in Venezuela? Yeah, I don't know how low the dollar will go. Um, it's really tough to say. I, I think metals, it's really tough. I mean, I'm not an extremist. I'm not going to say we're going to see the dollar down like, you know, like 80% or we're going to see really $10,000 gold. I mean, it's all possible, but I like to take from a logical technical trading standpoint, I look at the big term, long-term charts, and then you can map out what each pattern and consolidation is telling us, where the upside targets are. I mean, the next short-term target for gold is 2100. Then I see 2600 uh, potentially next year. And then it goes up into around the 34 to $3,600. That's as far as the charts are telling me that it can go. Now, uh, the markets are irrational. They can go way beyond what the technicals say. Uh, just like what we're seeing now in the stock market, you know, the average stock is down 28% sales year over year, yet they're hitting, uh, they're at still at the same price as they were uh, in January. So everything is just way out of whack and that's because everyone's piling in. So when that happens to gold and silver, they could skyrocket and go into a parabolic rally, a parabolic melt up, uh, just like we saw in Bitcoin a few years ago. It just went into this parabolic melt up, everyone piled in, it goes 20,000. And I mean, that's, that's could very well happen to metals and miners. And this is, this is the perfect storm. Is it this year? Is it next year? Is it 2022 when uh, loans and defaults really kick in and, and banking system potentially crumbles then who knows, but you, you, it's definitely going to be interesting. And again, I think you have to own metals and have them stored outside the financial system with a third party vault I don't think you want anything in a bank or safety deposit box uh, because who knows what's going to happen. Everyone in the financial markets, you can't trust them. Uh, you, they're all defaulting. They're covering everything up. They're printing money. It's like playing a game of Monopoly and the banker just keeps giving money out to the players because he doesn't want it to end because he's cleaning up. So it's just kind of like this big game that's, you know, we're, it's a broken game yeah, is what it is. It is a broken game. It is. They've been playing a game. They've been playing us. You know, as the massive population has been, you know, working at their jobs as nurses and accountants and, you know, their various professions, the bankers, along with the politicians, have been off, you know, making themselves incredibly wealthy and yeah. um, at our expense. And everyone knows it. It, it's widely known now. Um, yeah. There's a portion of the population that, of course, is hypnotized by, you know, you know mainstream media. Yeah. But um, generally speaking, most people are waking up and that's what's causing this. And I want to turn to politics just for a moment, Chris. Okay. Do you feel that the elections in the United States could actually determine the prices of precious metals? And do you think there's going to be a difference 
depending on which side is elected? I think elections is going to cause a lot of volatility. And I've talked with a lot of other traders and we don't really know, I don't really know what it's going to do. I think what's going on with metals is really going to be driven towards more stimulus coming into play, uh, the, the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, if we start seeing banks go bankrupt, we're going to definitely see metals continue to rally. I don't really follow politics. Um, it's just not my thing. It's, it's all fake. I mean, there's, you can't trust anyone anyway. I mean, <laughs> so I stick to the price charts as a technical analyst. I filter all news out and I follow price. So when price and volume are favorable, we look to buy. When things are looking bleak, we either are in cash or we short the market to profit from falling prices. So that's the nice thing about it. I don't follow really earnings of companies. I don't follow economic data uh, or politics. I just follow the charts. I can get my, I can be updated on the market every morning in about 20 minutes flipping through my series of charts and just filter out all other news. Now, news does affect the markets, but they're usually short-term blips. Um, so when it comes to politics, zero input really into uh, the trading. All I know is we got to be extra cautious, smaller position sizes when we come up to some type of big economic data to be released or the Fed speaking or elections. So just got to be cautious. Right. What is the best advice that you could give to investors and traders right now in this financial market? What should everybody be doing? Oh, everyone has got such a unique situation depending on their mortgages or loans, debt, um, their time horizon, how old you are. I mean, it really is a really broad uh, question. I think, uh, I think cash is important to have a, a reserve, a good chunk of your portfolio move to cash because I feel like we're on the last little bit of this bull market. I think you need to own 5 or 10% potentially more in precious metals, in physical metals. I, I really only buy physical metals and I store them outside of the banking system because if we do have some type of financial collapse, if the currency crumbles, banking system crumbles, you really need some type of insurance that's going to skyrocket in value as your other assets fall, potentially even real estate falls dramatically. So if you own, say, 10% in precious metals and you've got this much value overall, if this value drops from a financial crash, which is your savings accounts, your mortgage, everything falls in value, well, precious metals should just go up and counter that. So precious metals is just like buying home insurance. It's the way I see it. You buy enough of it, it has a nice physical value. It's not like insurance that you just throw money out the window every year and never use it. You buy it once, it stays there, it has value, you can resell it later, hopefully at a much higher price. And it's just there to be that insurance. So when one drops, the metals will, will rally and you're still kind of at par with your old value, your old wealth level. And so that's what I buy it for. I mean, I buy a little extra because I want to try and make more money, but uh, you definitely need some in there to counter losses elsewhere if the stuff hits the fan. That's very interesting that you're talking about holding cash because a lot of people are saying, you know, beware of cash, the dollar is crashing, you know, so on and so forth, put your money into metals. But what you're saying is hold cash just in case, because we really don't know what people don't do cash. And I get quite a bit of flack from it. We're like, why are we in cash? Well, I mean, the US dollar rallied 11% while the stock market crashed in March. So when it gets ugly, would you rather lose 36% on a stock market crash? 57% in gold miners, uh, there was a drop 57% in gold miners in March. Or do you want to move into cash where people pile into the US dollar and it rallies in the opposite direction? So yes, the dollar is falling, but when things get ugly, the dollar is going to rise as the global reserve currency. So it's way better to move to something that doesn't move at all, or at least rallies versus holding a basket of stocks, your favorite tech companies that get slaughtered. So that's why we moved to cash. And I'd rather hold in cash and, and potentially lose 1% or 2 or 3% a year on it if it goes down well, versus holding the stock market for another 20 30 60% drop. So there's nothing wrong with moving to cash and not making any money. I'd rather not make any money than hold on to positions that, that lose value. Sometimes you just have to sit out and watch the storm 
And when things start to make a little sense or things are at a value that from a technical standpoint, a fundamental standpoint, they start to make really good sense, you can start moving the cash back into whatever asset class that is. So I'm all about cash. Uh, I think it's a, a great spot to be. It's low volatility while the rest of the world is you know, be, becoming very high volatility. So cash is king uh, when, when things get really ugly. Wonderful. Cash is king and precious metals. Yeah. Beautiful. Now you have an amazing website, which is a gold mine for traders all across the world, no matter what level they're at. Please tell everyone about your website and how to follow your work. Sure. Yeah. So my website is thetechnicaltraders.com. And uh, there I provide uh, three different services depending on your style of trading or time horizon. I've got a long-term investing service for ETFs. You buy the SP500, metals, or bonds. And then I've got the technical trader newsletter there, which is for somebody who wants to be more secular or would play technology stocks last week for a nice move. Uh, we move around to precious metals and bonds. So we're more of a, a trader moving in and out of the hot sectors as they're oversold and then become overbought. And then we've got the wealth advisor, technical wealth advisor, which is really kind of like position trading. Each trade lasts around 40 days and we move into equities. When things start to show signs of weakness, we move to risk off, which are bonds or cash. And so it's very simple. We buy the SP 500 or the NASDAQ. And when things are starting to show signs of weakness, we move back to cash or bonds and bonds will go up as the stock market trades sideways or falls. So it's very simple. Everyone gets here either in equities or bonds. Sometimes there's a little bit of a cross. We have a bit of each, but we've got, we've got trading for investors, swing traders, and position traders like advisors who want to try to get some high beta on equities. Great. Tell everyone your website one more time. Sure. It's thetechnicaltraders.com. Perfect. And where are you on social media? Oh, the technical traders at YouTube. Or whatever the, uh, the forward slash set to technical traders and we're the tech trader at Twitter. Okay, beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. This is incredibly interesting, your details and your perspective. So cash, cash is king. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Michelle. It's been a great talk. Okay, we will have you back. Mr. Right. Chris Vermillion, expert financial analyst and the founder at the technicaltraders.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Halliday at portfoliowealthglobal.com.